For our final video of this week, we're looking at the Church of England and the reigns of James I and Charles I. These are what we call the Stuart monarchs. Uh, Elizabeth I dies in 1603. Um, she appoints her uh, cousin, James VI of Scotland, to uh, succeed her as James I of England. Um, he is from the House of Stuart, and so hence we have this Stuart monarchy. Uh, even though by this time Scotland has moved towards becoming uh, Presbyterian in nature, uh, James is quick to support uh, the traditional positions of the Church of England. Uh, as um, James comes onto the scene, there are two tension points within the Church of England that we have already been reviewing and just want to underscore here. There is what we can call a Calvinist consensus, that there, there's a broadly Calvinist theology within the Church of England. This helps keep at bay the, the Puritan strains of the church that want to uh, push it further towards reform. Puritans are still considered part of the mainstream church, and the Calvinist consensus is trying to hold them in um, and, and adhere to the polity of the Church of England and not see, uh, seek to establish something else. But on the other hand, we have a group emerging called avant-garde conformists. Avant-garde has a sense of radicalism or, or pushing the limits in their own way. Uh, so what, what, what's an avant-garde conformist? Well, it's someone who is upholding the, the um, Church of England, but wants to push it further on a different continuum. Um, it views that public worship is very important, whereas Puritanism wants to emphasize preaching alone, but also wants to say that church rituals themselves are spiritually efficacious, that the doing of the liturgy uh, grants some something to the Christian. Um, Puritans find that very much like works righteousness are very suspicious of it. Moreover, avant-garde conformists really hold to a notion of a divine right of the episcopacy, that Episcopy itself is divinely ordained, and there's no other legitimate form of church governance. That's very different than, say, Richard Hooker's view that wants to argue simply that episcopacy is the right kind of governance here in England, and a different kind of governance might be appropriate elsewhere. So we have this Calvinist consensus then the Church of England trying to hold at bay uh, both Puritanism and avant-garde conformists during the reign of James. Uh, as he comes to the throne, uh, James um, passes a, a document called Constitutions and Canons Ecclesiastical in the year 1604. Uh, this document emphasizes the uniformity of the Church of England and that bishops have oversight for authority in the Church of England and that bishops are the appropriate source by which uh, discipline is administered. This document says that anyone can be excommunicated for a number of reasons. For refusing to subscribe to the 39 Articles, which we had seen as this reformed document. For impugning, for speaking ill of the rites and ceremonies of the Church of England. And for arguing that Episcopal governance is unchristian or contrary to the Word of God. All these things are clearly aimed at uh, Puritans. They could also, of course, be applied to Roman Catholics or recusants as well. So they have kind of a double-edged nature to them. But what's even more striking <clears throat> is the enforcement of ceremonialism in different parts of uh, this document. Ceremonial here means um, prescribing certain kinds of actions during the worship in church. So it requires kneeling in church for the general confession of sins, for the great litany, and for the other prayers. Um, that act of kneeling for Puritans could be very controversial because it could seem as if one is kneeling before something else than God. Moreover, people are required to audibly pray with and respond to public prayers during services, that one has to say amen, but you can't just mutter the prayers or mumble along, but you really have to say the words. So there's heightening of an emphasis on conformity and uniformity in worship is happening here. Moreover, 
there is a disciplining of dissenting clergy. So if ministers don't affirm the Book of Common Prayer, for instance, they could be suspended. So we see a lot of tactics here at play um, aiming at Puritans. So what we could see then over the course of uh, the reign of James I is this effort to hold at bay the various tensions uh, between the communities. This all shifts, though, when Charles dies, um, or rather James dies in, in 1625, and his son, Charles I, becomes king in that year. He has a more strongly conformist, avant-garde conformist views than his father. Um, he has a circle around him. One of those key figures is William Laud, who becomes Archbishop of Canterbury, in 1633. Um, in this context, we have to understand that the Thirty Years' War has broken out in Europe between uh, Protestants and Catholics. And there was a widespread expectation that Protestant England would come to the aid of the reformed um, state entities in Europe that are trying to fight off the Habsburg Empire and other rivals. But England stays out of the battle. And there's real suspicion about Charles around this. Uh, Charles is married to Henrietta Maria, a French princess who is Roman Catholic. And so there's an increasing suspicion that Charles has these um, secret Catholic leanings and that maybe there's an enemy within the royal family itself who's keeping England from acting on behalf of beleaguered Protestants. As a result, there's an increasing Puritan critique of Charles I, an attack on him in uh, pamphlets, etc., that leads Charles more and more to the conformist wing, the avant-garde conformist wing of the Church of England, and to embracing uh, specifically anti-predestinarian views, uh, which is a hallmark of the avant-garde conformists as well, um, really to push back against some of the very core things that Protestants hold to. And so he begins to cooperate with William Laud, who also holds his very avant-garde conformist views, to institute a whole new set of policies that give a different tenor to the Church of England. So, for example, Laud really lifts up this notion of the beauty of holiness, that uh, church decorations and beautiful liturgies are inherently edifying religiously. And then a de-emphasis on preaching as a result. So who cares about preaching? Let's just have a really beautiful liturgy that will lift people up into a transcendent space. Laud also holds the view that sacraments can be vehicles of grace in and of themselves. So really pushing back on a memorialist uh, vision of sacraments. And so thus, a real sense that Laud is trying to undo many of the reformed elements of prior reformations in the Church of England. He, so he is decentering preaching as a central act and putting liturgy and ceremonial in its place, it seems. And so if he's doing that, does he even hold to things like uh, justification by faith alone? Does he really hold to core Protestant teachings? So uh, the split between Puritans and the conformist wing just grows wider and wider. And these splits then have uh, really tangible manifestations or flashpoints. So one is that Laud um, passes uh, decrees that say the communion table should be treated as if an altar. That is... Um, Laity ought to uh, be forced to kneel to receive uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, Puritan opponents are attacked by Laud. They're imprisoned. They're subjected to corporal punishments. And so Puritans come to see Laud as leading perhaps a papist plot to seize the English church, to turn it over to Rome. In fact, it gets to such a degree that the Pope hears about all of Laud's things and says, would you like to become a cardinal? Sounds like you're on our side. And Laud has to write sort of a public letter uh, denouncing the Pope and denouncing papacy. 
But this conflict between uh, conformists um, and and dissenting Puritans um, is going to really set the stage for the civil war that's about to come. One of the key sources of conflict here also is the notion of predestinations and the sense that conformists are downplaying differences with the Roman church in order to marginalize Puritans and their space in the Church of England. And indeed, in many ways, Laud um, succeeds in chasing them out of the Church of England. What I've done here is try to set a stage for what we're going to do next week, which is try to see the effect of the outbreak of the English Civil War um, and the shakeout of the life of the Church of England, both in England itself and then as we move across to look at the English North American colonies. So I hope this has laid out a very interesting uh, groundwork for thinking through uh, what the Church of England is like in the 16th and early 17th centuries.